thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Lana Monday Emmett, and I'm absolutely ecstatic about today's guest. In spite of his blindness, our guest has been a National Olympic weightlifting champion, a successful investment broker, the president of an Emmy award-winning narrative television network and a highly sought after author and platform speaker. He is the author of more than 40 books, including the bestseller, The Ultimate Gift, which is now a, motion, a major motion picture from 20th Century Fox. Five of his other novels have also been made into movies with two more in production. For his work in making television accessible to our nation's 13 million blind and visually impaired people, the President's Committee on Equal Opportunity selected him as Entrepreneur of the Year. He has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, USA Today, and has been seen on Good Morning America, CNN, and the CBS Evening News. He was also chosen as the International Humanitarian of the Year, joining Jimmy Carter, Nancy Reagan, and Mother Teresa as recipients of this honor. Please join me in welcoming Jim Stovall. How Thank are you, Jim? <laughs> great. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Well, we're tickled to death to have you. And I understand that you have a new book coming out that was co-authored with Napoleon Hill Foundation CEO Don Green called The Gift of Giving. Well, Don, yeah, and it's, it's an exciting project because, um, you know, Don and I started talking about this a long time ago. Uh, one of my goals for many, many years was to give a, a million dollar gift uh, to uh, my alma mater, Oral Roberts University here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oh, wow. And we ended up giving a million and a half to launch the Stovall Center for Entrepreneurship. And Don one day asked me, how did that all come about? And I kind of told him the 40 year journey of that gift. And he said, this needs to be a book. And I said, well, only if you'll get with me on it and let's do this because, um, you know, th there's only three things we can do with our money. We can spend it, which everybody's really good at. We don't need any books <laughs> to spend your money. You can save and invest it. We're not as good at that as we should be, but there's plenty of books about that. And then we can give it away. And there's a certain portion of every dollar we earn that should be spent, a certain portion saved, and a certain point given away. And, uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, an important flow to get in your life. In fact, I always tell people, the most fun you'll ever have with money is giving it away. And for a number That's of right. years, <laughs> yeah, no, a number of years, my wife, Crystal and I, our goals have been more around giving than they have been around how much money do we get? Because, uh, you know, for years we had this goal to give away a million dollars. Well, if you can give away a million dollars, you're having a good year. So you don't really have to worry about yourself. Uh, it, it's like anything else in life. If you take care of everyone else and help them get what they want, you'll get more than you ever imagined. And that's kind of what this book's about. That is absolutely awesome. So I have to ask, where do you pull your ideas from? You know, I'm embarrassed to tell you and your your uh, audience that uh, when I was a sighted person and could read with my eyes, like you and most of your uh, viewers are, um, I don't know that I ever read a whole book cover to cover. I had a plan for my life. I was going to be an All-American football player and go into the NFL. I made my living doing that. And then one year I was diagnosed with a, 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 a disease uh, that would cause me to lose my sight. It was actually during a preseason uh, uh, physical we had to take. And then, you know, I, I immediately realized there's no blind guys in the NFL, so I better do something different. And oh. I changed my life around. And it was about that time I discovered the National Library for the Blind. And I participated in a study on high-speed audio listening on compressed digital audio. And I went from not reading at all to reading at an extremely high speed via audiobooks. And I read a book every day. There hasn't okay. been a day in the last 20 some odd years I haven't read a whole book. Oh, so, that's amazing. Yeah, and becoming a reader is what made me want to be a writer. You know, I write the kind of books that I would want to read. You know, if you want to know what's going on in my life and uh, what I need to be working on, just read the book I just wrote. And I, you know, I kind of write it for myself and let everybody else, you know, read it and follow along. Right, right. So I'm going to ask this. 
What is the best money you have ever spent as a writer? Um, more books to read, more, you know, um, you know, if you want to become a writer, you have got to become a reader. And, Absolutely. you know, just that whole process of, you know, what would I do with this or that or the other thing? And, it, and I think writers' conferences and groups are great as long as you don't buy into the absolute nature of most people's messages. If you go to writers' conferences or you get in a group, someone will show up from out of town with a briefcase and tell you, you have to do it this way. If you don't write every day, you'll never make it. Or if you don't get up early in the morning, you'll never make it. Or if you don't write on a computer, you'll never make it. Or if you don't, no, I, I, I have seen successful world-class authors do everything you can imagine and a lot of things you cannot imagine. And the only thing I know that is an absolute, you know, great writers read a lot and great writers write a lot. And the way you write good things is you start out by writing bad things. And uh, one of the best uh, things that came out of uh, literature recently was uh, they re-released a version of Ernest Hemingway's movable piece. And his uh, great grandson put it out. And one of the things he put in the back of the book was Hemingway's first draft of that piece of work. And what was so great about it was uh, you know, when I read Hemingway, I can get intimidated pretty quick. And I think, <laughs> you know, I, I want to quit and never write again. Well, when you read his first draft, you think, wow, I can write. You mean, he's no better. <laughs> and and you, you see how bad his first draft was, too. So, uh, um, you know, just the willingness to, uh, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, James Michener, said every aspiring writer is filled with eight volumes of garbage. I'm paraphrasing Mr. Richter, <laughs> but he said, filled with eight volumes of garbage. And the ones you've heard of, the ones you know, the ones that become famous, they're willing to write through those eight volumes of garbage to get to the goal to be on. And, um, but unfortunately, everybody wants to, uh, you know, take their first draft and they compare that to other people's published work. It's like going on Facebook and letting, looking at people's highlight reel of their life, yep. and you think, man, I, I got nothing going on here. <laughs> right. Very common. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you had your Wisdom for Winter series, because there are four, four books, am I right? There's a fifth one out now, and there was a book before that started called Today's the Day. So we've done six volumes now of my syndicated columns. Right. So I have to ask this, since I know all of those books are, you know, sort of connected, right? So yes. do you want each of your books, because you've written so many books, do you want each book to stand on its own? Or are you really trying to maybe build a body of work with connections between the books? Well, I certainly hope when people read my books or watch the movies, that they will then go back and explore what else I've written. But I, I write every book as if somebody's in a bookstore somewhere and discovered that one title and they're going to read that. And that is hard to do because uh, my ultimate gift series, there are four novels. Uh, my detective series, there are two. Uh, I got my homecoming historical just released my third in that series. And, you know, what you have to do is find a balance between, uh, informing people who have never read that work before so they get a good character development and a background on it but you don't want to bore your normal readers the people that have read all your stuff you don't want to bore them to death by recapping stuff they already know so you kind of find little mechanisms ways to uh, get a lot of information to your new readers as quickly as you can and uh, it's hard to do in a book it's even harder to do in a movie because you have two hours and, you know, you have to assume people haven't seen the first or the second movie in the trilogy. So you kind of have to very quickly um, get the new viewers up to speed. Right. Right. So when you are really thinking about writing a book, what kind of research do you do before starting? Do you do research? Um, I do. I am, you know, this uh, coronavirus has created... Uh, 
an opportunity for me. I'm, I'm not on the road. I'm not doing the speaking engagements. Uh, none of the movies are in production right now. So uh, for years, I've wanted to kind of write a, a larger book, a, a retrospective on the 20th century. And uh, because I think that 100-year period in, in the annals of, of recorded history of humanity has more amazing breakthroughs than all the other centuries put together. And so I picked 18 separate things that I think were profound in that century and started writing about them. So I've had to read, um, you know, I've probably read 30 books so far, just researching that book. And then, and then on each of my homecoming historicals, I, I write the book, but the foreword uh, uh, is always written by the leading historian in that field. Um, my One Season of Hope book is about Harry Truman. So the curator of the Truman Library wrote the foreword to that book. And then, then I wrote a book called Top of the Hill about Napoleon Hill. And Don Green did that for me and helped me with the research. And then mm -hmm. just finished Will Rogers and the, uh, and the curator of the, of the uh, Will Rogers Museum. You know, fact checked that and got it right because, uh, you know, he, he, the best intentions um, can go awry. I, right. When I was doing research for the Will Rogers book, they showed me a previous book, and then and the, the, this author did a lot of research, and he talked about Will Rogers' first trip around the world, and he embellishes this story. He comes back to the United States through the Golden Gate, and and uh, comes back to San Francisco, and they have this really romantic scene of him steaming under the Golden Gate Bridge, and he goes on and on and on. The problem was the book came out, and then somebody pointed out that bridge wasn't built for another 17 years. Oh, no. <laughs> And, you know, so you just need somebody that checks everything you say. Right. <laughs> Definitely makes sense. <laughs> you bet. So how many unpublished and maybe, I don't want to use the word half finished, but how many unp unpublished books do you have right now? Uh, none. I, I've written 47 books. They are all out. Um, you know, I have the research for the century book. And the book you and I were discussing, The Gift of Giving, is done, and it will be out. But uh, And then I have a file at the office with, uh, it's called my project list, and I go over it on the 15th of every month, and it's books I want to write in the future. And there are, oh, at last count, there were 40 or 50 books on there, which is as many as I've written in the last 25 years. So. Um, you know, I will, I will be an old and, and happy man if I write all of those books. <laughs> so how long does it usually take you to write a book? Um, it really varies. I, I, uh, the fastest book I ever wrote was The Ultimate Gift. I had never written fiction before. I had written seven books before that. And the publishers just kept wanting more and more books. And... I got to the point where I'd written everything I knew and a few things I only kind of suspected. So when they wanted another book, I decided I got to make something up. So the only thing I had in my mind when I started that project was the first line of that book. And I went to the office and as a blind person, I dictate all of my books and columns and screenplays to some very talented people in my office. And um, we started and uh, I, that book just flowed. I didn't know what the 12 gifts would be. I didn't know where the story was going. It came to me as I dictated it. And I wrote that book in five days between wow. my other appointments and, and phone calls in the office. That's the fastest, the easiest I ever wrote a book. And the way I dictated that book is the way last I heard 8 million people now have read that book around the world. I, they're never an edit, never a rewrite. And then, wow. and then I have other books that took, um, you know, six months to write. Um, and ironically, the collaborations take long because, you know, you would think, wow, you got somebody else writing half the book for you. Well, you got to wait on their half and make sure it fits and, and, you know, all those sorts of things. So, you know, anywhere between five days and six months. Wow. So do you have, do you view writing as maybe a kind of spiritual practice in a way? 
yeah, I, you know, for me, it's an outlet. Um, when I finish a book, um, I'm done. I, you know, I'm like a woman that just had a baby. I, I, <laughs> I'm done with that, and I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> and um, and uh, and then we have, you know, I don't like writing. I like having written is what I enjoy. And, and but then after you know, a few few months or whatever it is, an idea will come to me and I'll think, what if this and what if that? And the next thing you know, you've got a book idea working and it, uh, there you go. And so they kind of write themselves. I am not one of these people that writes every day. I, you know, I write when I feel like I want to write something. And, uh, you know, I finished the book with Don. I'm working on the, the next book, but then... Uh, you know, I'm okay. I, I don't, I don't have a goal. Like I said, I've written 47 books. Uh, eight of them have turned into movies now. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm just not going to do number 48 just to have another book. I really want to say what I want to say and make it matter. And that's an important thing for me. Right. Right. So I wanted to ask you, I was looking through the ultimate gift, the book, your book, and I get to, chapter 11 and it's called titled the gift of giving and then yeah. under that it says the only way you can truly get more out of life for yourself is to give part of yourself away yeah so how does that correlate to the book that's coming out well it, it really does i mean it, it is i mean i believe our purpose in being here is to find our gift and and fully exploit that gift and the and we find meaning in life when we give it away and um, the happiest people i know do that it was churchill that said you make a living by what you get mm -hmm. you make a life by what you give right and i, I believe that to be true and um you know I, I this book is designed to help and encourage people to make giving a an orderly planned programmed part of their life, just like anything else. And, uh, and I, I think once you do that, um, you'll be a happier person and you'll make the world a better place. Absolutely. And I know that's the Napoleon Hill foundation. That's their mission is to make the world a better place. So it's great to have so many wonderful people that are on board with that, <laughs> especially you setting the example. <laughs> That well, I, I mean, I've done a number of books for them and donated all the proceeds, including this book. But, you know, you talk about the, the, the Winner's Wisdom books. I, I have donated five of the, all the royalties for five of those books to the foundation. But it happened because the, Don gets my column each week and reads it. And he, one day he called and said, how many of these columns you got? I said, Don, I've been writing <laughs> a week column for 20 years. So I guess I got over a thousand. He said, what do you do with them? I said, they're in a file drawer somewhere. They've already appeared in hundreds of newspapers, magazines, and online publications. And he said, what if I wanted to publish a, a compilation of those? And I said, knock yourself out. And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I'd, I'd be happy. I mean, so he took something that was basically a byproduct sitting there gathering dust and turned it into, you know, an amazing product that's reached a lot of people around the world. And it's, it's raised a lot of money for the foundation and, uh, and the work they do. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the foundation, they fund scholarships for so many students. And that's just a real blessing. I mean, <laughs> to be able to have proceeds and income to be able to do that. So I want to ask, too, how did you and Dawn sort of collaborate? How did you guys break out the, the process? Like when you're doing the book, when you're writing the book, how did you say, okay, Here's what I'm going to focus on, and here's what Don's going to focus on. Um, both of us are fairly independent, and when you read the book, you'll see the first half of the book is me, and then Don wrote his, and then we kind of collaborated on the so what, the, the, the stuff at the end of it. But most of the opening of it is me telling the story of starting with absolutely nothing and growing to the point of being able to give you know, uh, we've given over 500 scholarships to send kids to college and, and in the, the Stovall Center for Entrepreneurship and the other things we've done that are just projects that uh, excite us and energize us. And so, um, 
it's that story and then don tells the story of the foundation and uh you know and it, then we encourage other people to think about what's your story what do you want to give and do and create in the world and you know uh, i mean uh, one thing we know is you can't take it with you what do you want to do that that really matters and is going to make a difference for somebody else because uh, most of us have more stuff than we know what to do with <laughs> and, um, you know one of the fastest growing industries in north america is the storage industry right. so you know we're renting space to store stuff that we don't want i mean it, it's really ridiculous and uh and uh, the idea of uh, becoming a, a great giver is uh, is what motivated i think don and i both that's wonderful is there is there any part that you wrote that was edited out of the book um no not really i mean um you know there there's there's a couple places in there that i i write about uh how important Don is to me and how special I think he is. And they came back and said, Don's not totally comfortable. <laughs> and, he is very humble. <laughs> I think my was get over it. I mean, I, I, I'm not taking that out. I mean, that, that's my opinion and I'm sticking to it. I'm still the, I, I told Don, I am still the world's leading authority on my opinion. And I'm sticking to it there. Oh, that's priceless. <laughs> oh, gosh. So tell me, last question. What advice do you have for writers, up and coming writers? Um, read everything you can. Find something that excites you and write about it and write the book you would want to read. You know, this is a book, I would read this book. And it's good to do that because in the beginning, you may be the only one reads your book for a while, but. Uh, so read everything, uh, write something that matters to you, and just keep writing. Just keep writing, and uh, and it will happen for you. And there are people, you know, their first book, their second book doesn't create. The, you you look at a guy, you know, John Grisham, you know, a big time New York Times bestseller. Well, his first couple of books just kind of laid there on shelves and didn't go anywhere. Then he wrote one big book, and all of a sudden, those books that hadn't sold took off and became big time books and movies. So, you know, I, I just, um, that would be the advice and don't get intimidated, just keep writing. I mean, and I know there are times it seems absurd that I'm gonna write something that people should spend their time and money on. But, uh, you know, I'm the guy that writes books I can't read that are turned into movies I can't see. And <laughs> it makes sense to me. So if I can do this, absolutely anybody can do this. Very good words, excellent words. So just to recap, the book is called The Gift of Giving and it is pre-order now, available at Amazon. And um, it's released, gonna be released on July 8th, is that right? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jim, so much for being with us. We certainly appreciate your time and, and all of your wonderful words. and. Looking forward to reading this book cover to cover. I've got so many of your books here on the desk that I've gone through and read. <laughs> you are just a wonderful, a wonderful writer and just a real treat to speak with. So well, thank, thank you, you so you much. Are, you are a wonderful interviewer and I appreciate it. And uh, just getting to visit with you and your audience about one of my favorite things, which is books. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for joining us. And everybody, we'll see you next time. Don't forget to go buy that book on Amazon. Bye-bye.